Hey, this is Joe at Great Bench Electronics. Welcome and welcome back. So we are ready to get started on this high watt build. Very exciting. But before we do, I thought it'd be fun to have a quick look at the schematic and the layout from Serratone uh, to see sort of where this project is headed. Uh, so first off, if you have any interest in building a high watt or even just understanding them better, how they're built and uh, what the schematic looks like, how, why they sound the way they do, uh, you're going to want to check out highwatt.org. Uh, that is a website that is run and I assume still maintained by Mark Huss. All the schematics I'm going to show you are from Mark. They are his drawings, not mine. So shout out to Mark. Thank you for the drawings. Uh, I will do my best to put them to good use. So uh, we are going to be looking at one of the, this is the early 70s linked input preamp. I only chose this because it's closest to what the sorry tone layout shows. Uh, the truth is for at least this half of the high watt preamp, there isn't a massive difference in the design. Little values change here and there. Once we start to get here, it starts to get a little funky, but um, we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. So the big difference between what we're building in this is we don't have this linked input set up. This is so that you can use the linked input and then you essentially have like the, uh, the jumper channels like you will see people do manually with the jumper cable. I'm going to be building it the old way where it's uh, two separate inputs for each channel, high and low. And then you can use that jumper cable if you want to get the sort of parallel input gain stage thing happening. So anyway, input coming in, two gain stages set up a little differently depending on high or low. Two different coupling caps, which is really where that uh, brightness comes from. One nanofarad is going to start to roll off high frequencies a lot sooner than 22 nanofarad. Coming in here to another gain stage, pushing through to the tone stack. It's a sort of Fender-ish tone stack, but the values are different. Fender, Marshall, High Watt, they used fairly similar tone stacks, at least when you compare them to like a Marshall, or excuse me, to like an Orange or an Ampeg, where they had that uh, Baxendall tone stack style. Master volume here is pre another gain stage here. Um, so this is why, one of the reasons why you end up having a very clean sound out of a high watt. This is where it starts to get a little weird. Uh, so we have a, a, a triode stage here that is not a gain stage, is there's no meaningful voltage gain coming out of here. The purpose of this is obviously it's a cathode follower and it is pushing a very low impedance signal out of the cathode of this triode. And it's also providing a DC bias level to the grids of the phase inverter here. It's a long tail pair phase inverter, but unlike Marshalls and fenders, it is not AC coupled, it's DC coupled. It's, there's a fixed, re relatively fixed DC uh, voltage going into the grids of these two triodes here. Having a fixed DC bias on the phase inverter here is going to prevent distortion. So this, if you want to know where the high watt sound comes from, if you want to pin it down to one thing, it's this, it's the phase inverter, the, the fixed DC bias on the grids of the long tail pair. Uh, that is going to uh, tamp down on the distortion available from this phase inverter, as opposed to Marshall's and Fender designs where a lot of that preamp sound and character comes from the phase inverter distortion. Like I've said in previous videos, I'm not super techie with this stuff. I understand the general gist, but if you're more interested in the math and the deep underlying knowledge about how the high watt fixed bias phase inverter works, I'll put a link to an article in the description that goes over it in much more detail. All right, moving on to the high watt output stage. This is a 100 watts EL34, so four EL34 output tubes. We've got the input signals, approximately 180 degrees out of phase input signals coming in from the phase inverter. That's coming from these coupling caps right there. We got the negative bias coming in via the 100K grid leaks. Negative bias voltage, approximately negative 40 volts or so. 22K grid leak resistors going into the grids of the output tubes. The cathodes are shown here connected directly to ground, but we're actually going to be putting in one ohm sense resistors so that we can see the current flowing through each tube. Uh, we choose one ohm because that'll make the current directly proportional to the voltage that drops across the resistor, which is ohm's law. This shows 100 ohm screen resistors. We're going to be upping that to 1K, five watt resistors in order to just protect the screens a little more. Obviously I don't have the Partridge transformers, but I do have those nice transformers from the Garnet and they're set up pretty much the same way with three uh, impedance outputs on the secondary, 16 to eight and four, all is the same. This output transformer doesn't have the 100 volt output, but no one uses that anymore. So that's out. Also the slave out is not there because again, no one uses that. As far as the impedance selector, uh, I didn't realize that I ran out of my impedance switches. I had bought, you know, a handful of them a while back and have just burned through them. And unfortunately now NKK, the company who made that switch does not make them anymore. So this appears to be like the selection now, if you're, if you're going to go with a standard like rotary switch with a, a brass regular, like three eighths, um, shaft, this appears to be the selection. Uh, it is made by a company called NIDEC, who used to be, or they acquired 
uh, Fujitoku, and the part number is SRF113. I know uh, Antique Electronic Supply has them. I don't know if anybody else has them. That's where I had to get mine, Antique Electronic Supply. They're a little expensive. They're like 14 bucks or so plus shipping, but they do the trick. It's a six amp, um, 125 volt, single pole, triple throw switch, and it will do the job. I believe I've used one of those before and they felt pretty good, but um, we'll see. I haven't gotten it again yet. I've just ordered it, so we'll see what that's like when it gets here. And then of course we have the power supply for 100 watt, high watt amps. Again, I don't have the Partridge Transformers. I do have the Transformers from the Garnet, of course, and they are going to perform the same function. There are some key differences. First off, there is no 220 volt tap on the primary of this transformer. I don't need that, of course. I'm in North America and our wall voltage is anywhere from like 117 to 125. So the 117 tap will do just fine. We are gonna be installing the uh, mains fuse, of course. Mains indicator, I'm also gonna be using a neon like the schematic shows here. The high tension supply for my transformer is not designed for a full wave bridge rectifier. It is designed for just standard full wave rectification, non-bridge. And so instead of this setup here, we're gonna have just a string of diodes that will provide our full wave rectification for the power supply. The high tension winding has a center tap, which will be connected to the ground. This transformer also does not have a bias tap. Uh, so we will be creating a separate bias supply coming off the high tension winding. So the bias is gonna look very different to this. And the heaters are pretty much the same center tap. This shows the center tap connecting directly to ground. I'll probably be doing 200 ohm resistors to create an artificial center tap, which should help with hum. Beyond that, all this is the same. 220 microfarad caps. I think the ones I have are 400 volts, but it'll be the same amount of filtering. 220 balance resistors, standby switch in the same place. All this is the same. So that's pretty straightforward. And then here is the Seriotone layout for their Hey Watt 103, which is high watt. It's based off the original high watt layout. And so we're gonna be sticking to this pretty closely. The indicator, like we saw before, is gonna be a neon. So it's not gonna be connected to the heater supply. It's gonna be connected to the main switch so that the lamp comes on when you hit the power. The original high watts and also the Seriotone here show the 68K grid stopper resistors for the input stages of the amp on the input jacks. I'm gonna be moving this down to the pins of the jacks. It's just better practice to get those grid stoppers as close to the socket as possible. Other than that, we're gonna be sticking to this layout pretty closely. It's a Seriotone chassis, Seriotone boards. So we're gonna be going with that. And today, of course, we're gonna be assembling the preamp and phase inverter board. So this is a sort of blown up picture of that. And in regards to the board here, there are some considerations. First off, if you ever looked at a high watt inside, they're very clean, very neat. Uh, they have a very particular way of being built that was coming all the way back from the origin, original designer, Dave Reeves, passed on to the builder he, that he hired, Harry Joyce. There's a very particular way the high watts are built. And for the most part, I don't wanna deviate from that just out of respect, I guess. However, I will be changing it up in one way. Uh, so if you look at this board, there's a lot of wire connections. So there's wire co connections coming out of the board, of course, going to different off-board components, but there's also jumpers. There's jumpers between components. There's jumpers around spots, jumpers that go from board to board, side to side, and then across the board. And although I've never, I've never actually seen the inside of a high watt before, and I've definitely never seen the underside of one of these boards, but it must be busy under there. And it would be a real pain to work on it, I bet, if you have a problem. Like if this jumper gets cut, you're gonna have to get that whole board out of there to do something about that. Or you're gonna have to bring a, a, a jumper on the top side and make it look ugly. My thinking is going to be sort of a compromise. I'm going to do the wires here, which are connected up from the bottom of the board into the bottom of the turret. I'm gonna do those the way that Mr. Reeves and Mr. Joyce did back in the day, wires coming up from the bottom. But these jumpers here between turrets, I'm gonna do this on the top of the board. So this is all gonna be on the top, top, anything anything connecting two tur uh, turrets on the same board, that's gonna to be top side underneath the components. It's not gonna be quite as clean looking as other high watts because there will be extra stuff on the board, but it should also, one nice thing is it'll prevent having to do more than one wire or one connection going to the underside of the turret, which was a concern because those holes are relatively small compared to the top of the turret. All right, I think that's enough chatter. Let's get started building. We got the preamp and phase inverter board here. I'm gonna start laying in these jumpers with, I got 18 gauge bus wire. We'll start putting that in, then we'll start throwing on some components.
All right, I've got all the top side jumpers wired into the turret board now. I did find that these turrets are a little bit harder to solder to than some of the others I've used, which I believe I've only used the Keystone turrets to my recollection. But uh, these ones from Striatone didn't want to take solder as well. I had to hold the heat on there a little longer than I normally would have and apply more solder than I normally would have to keep the heat up. The solder wicked okay, but it ended up having an excess amount of solder in certain places, uh, which is not a huge deal. It's maybe a little aesthetically displeasing, but uh, you can always go back with solder wick and pull some of that extra solder off if it's a really big deal. One thing I am going to do, though, to help facilitate attaching components to the top of the board uh, is I'm going to go in with a Dremel with a wire wheel here, and I'm going to just brush over the tops of the turrets to hopefully, if nothing else, give a better uh, mechanical connection for the solder to adhere to when I'm installing the components. So that's what we're gonna do now. Um, word of caution, if you're ever using a wire wheel on a rotary tool like this, it's an absolute must to wear safety glasses because if you get a little uh, sliver of brass or steel, whatever your wire wheel is, in your eye, uh, that is a really bad day. So that's what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna hit the top of these with the wire wheel and uh, clean them up a bit. All right, here is the assembled main turret board or preamp and phase inverter board for the HiWatt DR103. Next step would be to apply the wires to the bottom of the board and then use the standoffs as a guide to where the wires need to make that 90 degree bend to go out to the other outboard components like the pots and the tube sockets. So I think I'm gonna call the video here. If you enjoyed watching, I'd appreciate you hit the like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you wanna know when I make a new video. I'm Joe from Gray Bench Electronics. I will see you next week.